Hello all, uh, 6.15, we're about to get started in about 15 more minutes. Sorry I couldn't make it, but uh, glad you can watch from the comfort of your own home or wherever you may be. Uh, you don't get to enjoy the district taco, but maybe next time you can come out. Uh, but stay tuned, we'll be starting in 15 minutes. Um, yeah, we're live now, but yeah, we're here.
Right there. Cool. All right. That should be better. I don't know. I'm just getting. I'm still getting like, feedback. On this. Testing. 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 Testing, testing. One, two, three.
That's all right. That's all right. As a co-host, you're allowed to little slap. Wow. Uh, that was oh, <laughs> All right, we're one minute behind schedule. That's on you, buddy. Unlike the rain, it came, it saw, it kicked a lot of cars' butts. Did you see the picture of, uh, I think it was local DC, where I guess the, it came in flooded, and there was a guy standing on top of the hood of his car. I was just on oh, yeah. his phone. Yeah. Yeah. And then the water was up to like, Windows. I, 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 was I was feeling bad for myself until I saw that. Yeah. Uh, I had two and a half hours. Was that the picture of the guy with his little son? No, I just saw one guy standing in his car. It was the same thing. It was this guy with the Mercedes. It was completely like in a river of water. He's in his suit, standing on the top of the car with his son, who's sitting there playing. <laughs> he must have been taking him to school or something. Crazy. And it's hilarious. He's in a white shirt and tie. And yeah, he's got some bag on his head so he didn't get wet. And talking on the phone. Oh. Only in Washington. Mm -hmm. All right, let's get started. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Fadi here in a little bit, but we'll first go through a little bit of uh, introductory admin, distributor, kind of introduce you to the group, and then uh, we'll get started. So who's their uh, first time at DC Scrum User Group? Excellent. Welcome all. Uh, we've been up in the ante, and you're, you're getting uh, a taste of some better food. So we got District Taco tonight. I think we had it the other time, too. Uh, we'll, we'll still sprinkle in some Papa John's for the folks that still love <laughs> that, myself included. Uh, but yeah, we're our uh, DC Scrum user group, been around for quite a while. Actually, Fadi is uh, the official owner of the uh, DC Scrum user group. Uh, but it's uh, been in and out of you know, various organizers' hands. We all sort of contribute to co-organize uh, this collective community for anything agile-minded, lean-minded, Scrum, Kanban, you pick it. If you're trying to do it in a very iterative and incremental manner and try to get you know, your customers very happy with a high-quality product, you've come to the right place to kind of either help you get through that pain to get to that uh, panacea or uh, share your own knowledge of what's, what's been working and maybe even you know, gain some experience from some of those that have got it to work. Uh, and maybe some you're facing some struggles that many of us have probably str struggled with in the past and probably still struggle with. So uh, you're in the right place if you're trying to learn anything about this stuff. You can share your, your stories, but also learn from those of uh, the others that have been there on the, on the ground for a while. But if you do any uh, tweeting, you've got a DC Sug handle there and then the Excel account. Uh, so for sponsors, we couldn't do it without the sponsorship that we have. Uh, Excel has been sponsored for a very long time. This meeting space that you're in, thank you, Ann. Uh, meeting space you're in yeah. is our tra awesome. typical training space. We've got another area over there. We're apparently doing Certified Scrum Developer. I highly encourage that course to anybody that's trying to sling code and do it in an agile-minded way. Uh, you may need to update your practices a little bit and, and get those in a uh, uh, high-quality manner. And that class is definitely for that. But yeah, Excel provides um, services all throughout the DC area, whether it be agile coaches, uh, business analysts, even project managers, uh, what else do we have? User experience folks, data scientists, uh, data engineers, uh, DevOps type stuff, tons of work. We've got tons of uh, open uh, positions right now. Uh, you can check our website for, for any of those. Uh, but yeah, they provide a lot of stuff for uh, the things we do here. And then Fadi, I'll give you a chance if you want. Um, this is Fadi's company. You want to give a little uh, bit about Kais Kaisen Co? So, uh Kaizenco uh, is my company, I'm doing uh, training and coaching. Um, certified Scrum Master, Product Owner, as well as the new um, Advanced uh, Certified Scrum Master and Advanced Certified Product Owners uh, for those that are interested in getting their uh, Certified Scrum Professional uh, certifications. Uh, mainly uh, do public classes in the DC area and private classes um, all over the country. Thanks for your support. And then uh, just to give you some awareness of other user groups all around the DC area, I mean, pretty much anything you, you are doing in the business domain, there's probably a user group out there. These are just some of the ones that we either lead, sponsor, uh, but if you go look on meetup.com or Eventbrite, you'll probably find if any one of these will have a meetup <coughs> happening sometime this month, maybe next month. Uh, but you can get some uh, food, meet some folks in those areas. Uh, and learn, learn and connect and share as well with uh, those kind of communities. So uh, that's just a small sample of what's 
out there. In the, so Brian, in the, you work with Excel? Yeah, I'm one of the, yeah, we've got Mark back there, one of the co-organizers, wave hi. Uh, Sterling, uh, who else? We've got a lot of new people, so if I missed somebody that just joined, uh, no. So yeah, I'm one of the Excel folks. Uh, so we give training as well. I don't think I mentioned that, but similar to Fadi, we've got a certified product owner, certified Scrum master, certified Scrum developer, plus some of the uh, Kanban stuff. Uh, we also give like an Agile and Scrum in a day, kind of a level set for you, your, your company or your group or your teams. So just, you know, what do you mean by Agile minded? What do you mean by Scrum? And so that we all kind of get on the same page. It's a great, great kind of uh, level setter for that. Uh, if you're interested in taking any one of these, we do offer a discount code as a being a part of the user group, so you can reach out to me or Mark uh, and figure out what that is. It's just DC Sunk. Uh, if you put that into our um, register for the uh, training. All right, uh, we like to offer up. I know Excel has got a lot of positions open. Um, you can go on the website and find out what all is available. But if anybody here has got any uh, positions that they would like to advertise, just go ahead and pop up. Say your name, what company you're with, and the position you're looking to fill. Mm -hmm. Is it done? All right. All right, we'll flip that over. If there's anybody here looking to change positions, interested in a new career, a new role, looking for work, go ahead and pop up. Yep. Say your name and uh, skills, position you're looking to uh, do. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Excellent. Carlos, I'm from Apple. Excellent. So I'm Adi. I'm not really into consulting work. Well, yeah, I'm looking to transition out of medicine. So, you know, I'm hungry to learn something new and try something different. Awesome. You're in the right place. All right, excellent. All right, so uh, now I will stop with all that extra stuff for at least giving you awareness of what uh, the user group's about and who the sponsors are. <coughs> and introduce you to a great friend of mine who I've known uh, since 2014 when I joined Accela. Um, body very, uh, uh, handed the keys over to DC Sodrum for, for a little while. Kind of uh, did many other great things inside of Accela and now you know, it's come full circle back, uh, helping out tremendously. But he's gonna, you know, he does the certified Scrum developer, uh, Scrum master, product owner. He's a global speaker around all the Scrum gatherings, Agile 20, blah, blah, blah. Um, so he's a great friend of mine and a great mentor even. Uh, so I'll let you uh, listen to Fadi and some, some great things about uh, training and testing day one. All right, thanks. Thanks, Brian. Let's give him a warm welcome. All right, we're not up. Let's try it again. We went into production department. Yeah, it Right? But it works on my machine. Yeah. Ah. All right. Cool. It's great to have everybody here. Everybody survived uh, the rain that we had was crazy. Um, but today's talk is about testing. And before uh, we get started, um, I'd like you to pair up and uh, chat with your neighbor. Um, if you're currently uh, on a testing team, um, if, you have, if you're currently on an agile team, if you have testers on your team, and what kind of challenges you're facing, just to get us kicked off, right? Spend a few minutes, get to know your neighbor. Let's see where you are.
That's pretty good. Okay. What are, uh, for those of you that are on Agile teams, what are some uh, testing challenges you're facing? Anybody wants to share? Yeah. Developers that are doing, doing their own testing or doing testing of other developers' work, but who really don't want to do it. <laughs> All right. Developers doing testing of others. Developers work, but they don't want to do it. All right, yeah. Big challenge is people say they're in the agile world, they're not. They are mini siloed. All right. Mini waterfall. You feel it's mini waterfall or yeah, siloed? Yeah, completely water, mini waterfall. Uh huh. Yeah, we have a poorly written acceptance criteria for our tests. All right. Poorly written acceptance criteria. What was that? Yeah. Developers and testers are not used to work together. Yeah. Yep. They just do the thing and. You all right, no collaboration between developers and testers. Just realized I need to leave my, cli my client through the development of a testing plan and that my own orientation tends to be more waterfall than agile and I better learn a little bit about some other approaches. Ah, okay. you're, uh, right. you feel you're more waterfall than agile, you wanna learn other approaches, that's why you're here, that's awesome, all right. Um, oh, the last client I was working at, some of us, I think our biggest testing challenges uh, is because it's a large enterprise and just the dependencies everywhere. All right, a lot of dependencies very everywhere. Very painful. And uh, makes it painful, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you have anything to add? What tool to use? What tool to use, to yeah. manage the testing process. What tool to use to manage testing process? Lack of automation or misuse of automation makes yeah. regression testing a big challenge. All right, lack of automation makes regression testing challenging. All right, we're gonna touch, touch on pretty much all of these things that uh, we brought up here um, as we go along. So let's, let's, uh, let's get started, all right? Um, as uh, uh, Brian mentioned, um, I'm a certified uh, Scrum trainer. Uh, my background is in technology. I've been doing this uh, for more than uh, more than 20 years. Uh, and Kaizenko is my company where I do uh, training and coaching. I used to work here, um, and like Brian said, there Excel is hiring, so I can vouch that this is a great place to work. So if you're looking, um, please join. When I'm not doing this stuff. I'm either skiing or diving, all right? So, um, which I could have done diving today, basically. <laughs> all right, so um, typically, I'll walk you through um, how kind of coaching engagement start, where I see these problems that um, you all mentioned when we first started. 
a client comes and says, hey, Fadi, we're, uh, you know, we're doing Scrum, but we're not getting the benefits that we were expecting to get. So I'm like, uh, they're like, can you come in and help us out? I'm like, sure. Uh, so I go in and I'm like, are you, doing, uh, are you working in sprints? And they're like, yeah, of course, we're doing two-week sprints. I'm like, awesome. Most, most teams, when they first start, they struggle with uh, doing work in two-week sprints. And if you're already doing that, you're off to a great start. So I go in and I observe. They have um, their two-week sprints. And what I observe is they spend the first sprint doing requirements. They follow up with design. <laughs> then they do some coding. And then uh, they have the last sprint where they do testing. Uh, and uh, this might be some of you. This is a lot better than what we were doing before. But I'm pretty sure we all know now that just because we're using the word sprint and we're working in iteration doesn't mean necessarily we're doing Scrum or we're going to get the benefits that we want out of Scrum. In Scrum, we do all of these activities in a single sprint. The output of the sprint um, is working software. It's a product increment that we can use. So I explained that, and uh, the immediate reaction will be, ah, OK, sure. If we want to do all this stuff in one single sprint, we'll, we need to have a two month two months sprint. And I'm like, OK, but we can do better. Um, and we want to try to keep our sprints to uh, 30 days or less. All right, so uh, we go with that. All right, instead of two-week sprints, we stretched it. Now it's a 30-day uh, sprint. And, um, you know, the next phase that we go through, the next transition, is it's one sprint, and we spend the first couple of days doing requirements. We spend the next couple of days doing design. We spend most of the sprint doing coding. And then on the very last day, we hand everything off to our testing team. All right? Again, much better than before, but uh, who's going to complain here? All right, testing teams. They're going to be like, you can't spend the entire time you know, doing all these activities and then on the last day except, expect us to turn around all this uh, code that you've built in one single day. That's just not possible, right? So um, we talk about it some more. And by, by this stage, we've come to an understanding that you know, our requirements and our designs in Scrum um, emerge over time. All right, we've been doing this for a while, so now we, 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 the, the organization organ re realizes that requirements and designs are going to emerge over time. We don't, we, don't have the, we don't have to spend like the first couple of days of the sprint figuring this stuff out. We're doing it on an ongoing basis, uh, typically through uh, product backlog refinement as we're looking into uh, future sprints. So now the focus is just on the coding part and on the testing part. So the next kind of transition becomes uh, something like this, where uh, we have a coding sprint, because now we're doing requirements and design throughout. So now we're just, we just have what people refer to as a coding sprint. And then we do a handoff. And we have somebody else doing testing. And then in parallel, we have another sprint that's going on, coding sprint. And then we do a handoff to somebody else that's doing testing. And what basically ends up happening here is the bugs that were found here gets handed off to here, and then we test them, on, we test them over in the next cycle. So there's always this delay. We're always testing one sprint uh, behind. Right? We code, and then we test, and then any bugs we find, we hand them over. So there's always this delayed cycle. All right? Again, I see this a lot. Uh, and this is typically a team that is struggling with test automation. They're doing a lot of manual testing, so they cannot do their testing within the sprint. So they dedicate a, they dedicate a separate sprint just to do the testing, and then you have this handoff. All right? Maybe better than what we were doing before, but still not where we want to be. All right? Where we want to get to is um, we're doing all of these activities in a single sprint. And if we're doing a two-week sprint, on day one, we pick up an item. We pick up a product backlog item or a story. And maybe two or three days later, that item is done. All right? It's coded. It's tested. And then we pick up maybe two other items. And then three days later, those items are done. And then we pick up a few more items. And then a day later, those are done. And then we pick up one more item. And three days later, that's done. And maybe we finish one more item. So we're finishing our product backlog items or our user stories throughout the sprint. 
Now we pick something up on day one, work on it for the entire sprint, and wrap it up on the last day. We're, we're doing this throughout the sprint, and to do that, these toys have to be very, very, very small. We need to know, learn how to break them up very, very small, but also we need to learn how to test uh, within the sprint. All right, so somebody mentioned this earlier, please, Oh, don't be this guy, all right? We can't all be the most interesting uh, man in the world, all right? This is a bit cut off now for some reason, but, uh, you know, um, if you're going to do Agile, don't do it like Waterfall, all right? Typically, what I see a lot is people take their Waterfall approach, and then um, what they end up doing is uh, doing Agile purely on the development piece and they still have a big upfront uh, requirements and design phase and a big testing and painful deployment cycle uh, towards the end, all right? We need to have, um, we need to have, just trying to fix this up, all right? We wanna have delivery is the focus, all right? It's not development, it is delivery. And from the Agile Manifesto, we have two principles that focus on delivery. Principle that says we want to uh, deliver valuable software continuously, and not only do we want it to be valuable, but we want to deliver working software frequently, all right? So from an Agile perspective, it's about delivery. It's not just uh, the development part of it. So it's the end-to-end -end cycle. We need to figure out how we go through this cycle um, in, not in months or years, but in a matter of days, all right? And in this presentation, we'll focus on the testing aspect. What do we need to do from a testing perspective so that we can make this possible? What do we need to do so that we can go through this and finish it in a matter of days, not in months or years like we're used to in a waterfall perspective, all right? So um, to get us started, uh, we need to figure out what kind of testing we need to be doing, all right? So let's uh, pair up again and chat with your neighbor and try to brainstorm what are all the different types of testing that we should be doing um, or you are currently doing, all right? Think of all the types of testing that you're currently doing or the types of testing that you should be doing, all right? Quick chat with your neighbor and then we'll debrief. And those, and those online, you can go ahead and uh, use the chat. And uh, um, when I get feedback from the class, I'll pause and get feedback from the folks online. Yeah, exactly. Right.
All right, let's regroup. Cool. Uh, so what kind of testing should we be doing? Anybody can name a few of the tests that you should be, we should be doing. UAT, user acceptance testing, okay. Mm -hmm. What else? Stress test, yeah. Performance, Performance testing, absolutely. Unit testing, yes. Mm -hmm. Regression. Regression, mm -hmm. yeah. Integration. And integration. Experimental. Experimental? Boundary testing. Boundary yeah. testing, yes, okay. Usability. Usability, absolutely. Trying to engage the, the folks on the stream. Uh, do we have yeah, any feedback from there? Yeah, there was a good discussion um, that included um, the importance of automating your regression testing. So when you're getting ready for a release, it doesn't take your QA team days and weeks and months to run all these zeros. Automating your regression testing. Yeah, we'll talk in a second about, you know, which one of these tests that we're mentioning should be automated. Yeah. And, and on the acceptance side, using something that followed the specific, specification uh -huh. approach, you know, uh, development like Cucumber or something of that okay. sort, so that you can define it unambiguously before anybody's even written any code. The conversations with the business side and the dev team are really valuable. All right. Uh, making sure we have conversations with the testing. What else? Uh, I was wondering if that was the same as the user story. Uh, we, will, we will cover that. We will talk about that shortly. All right, so we, we talked uh, acceptance testing, uh, unit integration. Uh, we did uh, uh, regression testing, performance, stress testing. All, right, all of those are different types of tests uh, we should be talking about. And uh, here they are. Different lists, you're going to have more or less, but that's fine. These are all uh, types of testing we need to cover. And uh, Brian Barrick put this up and talked about it in terms of uh, tests that support uh, programming and tests that critique the product, tests that are technology facing, and tests that are business facing. All right? And I'll mention what, the, what these mean basically. Um, down here, um, we have tests that are technology facing. These are tests um, that are technical um, in nature. Uh, up here, there are tests that are business facing. These are tests that a business person would be concerned with. They are covering a business domain. Um, the tests on this side are tests that uh, support the team. Right, they're going to give the team confidence in what they are building, making sure that the team knows that what they are building works. And the tests over here um, critique the product. They basically tell us you know, how the product is doing. All right? It's just a way of organizing all these different tests that we talked about and thinking of them, which one are um, technical in nature, which one are business. Uh, you know, they, they, a business person would understand them which one are there to help the team, and which, one are, which ones are there to critique uh, the product. All right? So when we look at all of these tests, which ones should be automated? Right? Which ones should be automated? What do we think? Try to think of them uh, as a group. Right? Should we automate these tests down here? Unit, integration, component, and system. All right? Some of them, but not all of them. Not all of them. Not all of them. All right, we'll come back and talk about this. Should we automate functional tests, acceptance tests? Is that even possible? Yes. All right. I'm hearing yes and no here. 
All right. Yes and no here. Should we automate these types of tests? Yes. All right. Yes. How about uh, usability exploratory story no. test? No. All right. So here's uh, here's my perspective on this. All right. All of these tests should be automated, and this one category is the one category that should be manual. Pretty much any test that can be scripted, and by scripted I mean any test where we can say ahead of time, given that you have these conditions, do steps A, B, C, and D, and then you should expect result X. Anytime you can say that, that is a test that can be and should be scripted. Anytime you can um, ahead of time forecast and say, given these conditions, take these actions and expect this result, that is a test that can and should be automated. All right? And pretty much all of these um, fall in that category, except uh, the exploratory testing and the usability testing. Those require um, human interaction, human decision making, uh, to, d to figure out what the results are and to figure out what to do next. And we'll talk about it, uh, we'll talk about it shortly, and we'll talk about how do we automate all of these tests. All right, so bear with me. Now, we've talked about what kind of tests. We've looked a bit about, in terms of a testing strategy, which ones should be automated and which ones should stay manual. Now the question is, how many, right? These, this, that's a lot of testing, many different types. How many of these tests should we have? All right. Which ones should we do? Which ones should we focus on? All right. To, to do that, let me back up a bit just to walk through uh, you know, a simplified example so that we're clear on the terminology of what we're covering. All right. When I talk about unit tests, we're talking about a test that's testing a very specific functionality. All right. Typically, one method, one action. All right. Very, very small unit, as small as possible. When we talk about integration tests, we're looking at two things talking to each other. They can be within the same part of the application or they might be crossing boundaries. That might be an integration test. When we move on uh, to system tests, um, we're talking about multiple pieces talking together. So we're talking about a longer integration test. Uh, and covering multiple layers. And when we're talking about acceptance tests, um, we're looking at it from kind of the business perspective. We're testing functionality, and it's covering a large chunk of our application that delivers some business functionality. All right. When we look at these things and we want to figure out what kind of tests should we have, we need to consider these four elements. All right. By the way, the slides are up on my website. If you go to kaizenko.com under presentations, you will, you will find, you'll find the slides there. I'm seeing pe people taking pictures, but just so you know, it's already up there, all right? So um, why do we care about this stuff? So test coverage is how much of the code does this one test cover, all right? We're gonna, run, we're gonna write tests. We wanna make sure we're testing our code, all right? So test coverage is how much of our code uh, is being covered by this test. Test execution time is basically how quickly does the test run and give us back results. Test feedback is uh, when the test fails, does it give us meaningful feedback? How quickly do we know where the problem is? And test maintenance is um, how easy is it to maintain these tests? How often are we going to have to change them? All right. So when we're thinking about our test strategy and we're thinking about you know, how many of each test should we have, we want to look into these things. All right? How much is the test covering? How long does the test take to run? Um, well, when it fails, does it give us immediate feedback as to where the problem is? And how hard or easy is it um, to maintain? So let's come back here and look at this picture. When we look at test coverage, which one of these tests tests a bigger chunk of our application or give us, gives us the most coverage? Any thoughts? Which one of these gives us the most coverage? System. All right. It's this test up here, right? 
the system or acceptance is, is covering a big chunk of our application here, right? So those types of tests give us the most coverage, all right? When we talk about test execution time, which tests are gonna run the fastest? All right. It's gonna be this, right? These tests here, the unit tests, they're focused on some very, very small piece of code. They're gonna run and give us results pretty much immediately because they're very, very much, very focused. Uh, whereas the acceptance and system, they're covering a big chunk of the application. They're gonna take much longer to run um, and return the results. When we do get the results back, which ones are gonna tell us immediately where the problem is? Yeah. All right, does everybody see that? Again, it'll be the unit tests, all right? If, by the way, the circle is representing a test, right? If this test fails, we know the problem is in this piece of code. All right, if this test fails, we know the problem is in this piece of code. If an integration test fails, the problem can be up here or it can be here. I don't know, I'm gonna to have to spend some time and debug. If this test fails, right, the problem can be here, 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 or down here. All right, it can be in my database. Or if this test fails, it's even gonna take me longer to figure out you know, where, where the problem is, right? Um, so, for me to get immediate feedback, the unit tests, when they fail, I know immediately where the problem is, I know immediately where to go and fix it. All right? Is there a solution right. to get the same speedy result to the acceptance? There is, there is not, right? This is by, by its nature, an acceptance test is gonna take longer to run, mm -hmm. and by its nature, when it fails, um, you have, if, if you, all you have is an acceptance test, you're gonna have to debug um, where the problem is, all right? So we've covered, uh, we, we talked about code coverage, we talked about um, uh, execution time, we talked about feedback, and the last one is maintenance, all right? Maintenance is basically how often am I gonna have to update my tests, all right? When the code changes, um, which tests are gonna break that I'm forced to update, all right? Which ones are gonna break more often whenever a change happens? Yeah. Or the, the underlying code that you're testing? No, the, uh, the, uh, the actual script. Like if I change the code, uh, which tests are always going to break because I changed the code? Which tests will not break? Because they're built around the former code. Yeah. Got it. Right? Uh, because that, that's, that's the maintenance aspect. If every time I change code, mm -hmm. I have to change the tests, it's going to be very hard to maintain these tests. Yeah. And what typically happens is people get um, fed up and they start commenting the tests out. <coughs> and that basically uh, we, we lose all the benefits of those tests to begin with because they become, they become so hard to maintain because every time you make a change, I have to go back and update the tests. So which tests will I have to keep updating? Units. All right? Mm, not not unit. Depends how you write your units. Right. Uh, if you're you know, doing the black box, I'll say no. But anything that touches the browser is yeah. likely to break because people change it constantly. All right, anything that touches the browser is likely to break. Other thoughts? All right, th this follows, this follows uh, the same logic here, right? Yeah. This test here, if for some reason I change code here, code here, or code here, it's likely that this test will need to be updated when a change happens in any one of these places. Um, when we look at our unit tests, if this code changes, I only need to update this test right here. I don't need to update any of these tests over here, all right? This, it follows the same logic. A unit test is testing one specific piece of code, and unless that code changes, that unit test will likely not need to change. All right, does that make sense? Okay. Now, uh, because of that, when we think about our testing strategy, um, unit tests are giving us uh, the fastest execution time, the immediate feedback where we know where the problem is, and they're gonna be the easiest to maintain, all right? So the bulk of our testing, and we refer to that kind of as our, our, as our testing pyramid, the base of our pyramid um, needs to be built of mostly unit tests, all right? And we need a lot of them. Um, and those are gonna be, the, again, the fastest to execute and the easiest uh, to maintain. Next up um, are gonna be our integration tests. Next up will be our system tests. Next up will be our functional tests acceptance tests, UI tests, and so forth, for these reasons that I just mentioned, in terms of test execution, maintainability, 
um, as well as feedback. Now, when we add all of these uh, together, we get the coverage that we want um, by, ha by having a combination of these tests tackling different aspects of our application and testing different things. Each one of these tests is testing different things. Together, they create our testing strategy. All right? So let's keep going. Uh, the manual piece, by the way, is reserved for the exploratory <coughs> testing and the usability testing, and it becomes uh, a minimal part of our overall testing strategy. The majority of it becomes automated tests, which become our regression test suite, which we can run over and over and over again. All right, so we've covered all these aspects. Now the question is, um, when do we start testing? Any thoughts? Right away. All right, day one, right? That's the name of the stock, obviously. <laughs> We start testing on day one, and we're going to see shortly how, what does that mean and how do we do that. But let's start with this. All right? If uh, you're doing Scrum, you probably have a task board, whether it's physical or it's via a tool. Um, many of you probably have a task board that looks like this. Does, look, does this look familiar? Yes. yes? All right. So if you have a task board that looks like this, you are still thinking of testing as a phase. Yes. All right, we talked about it earlier in the pain points. All right, you're still thinking of testing as a handoff where we hand it over to somebody else and there's not much collaboration going on. All right, testing is not a phase. Testing is an ongoing activity that we do all the time. And in fact, we should be starting with testing. This is where what you want to be uh, aiming for, where testing is no longer an afterthought. We don't code and then we test. Part of what we do is build quality in. Testing is a regular activity that we do the same way we do coding. Um, it is not something we do later and we hand it off to somebody else to check what we do. We build quality in, we build quality products. So testing um, is just part of what we do. All right. So this is very common. Many of us have this. Many of us still have the mentality that we do testing later or somebody else does the testing and then we hand it off to somebody else. Um, on an agile team, on a scrum team, testing is an ongoing activity. And this is how you want to think about it. It's just something's not done. I'm doing it and then it's done. And when it's done, it means it's coded and it's tested and I'm not handing it over to somebody else to finish it for me. All right. So let's keep going. Who's doing the testing? Just gave you a hint earlier. I want to hear everybody say it. Who's doing the testing? All right, the entire team. All right, testing is everyone's responsibility. Everybody has a role to play. It is not just a tester's responsibility. And that's the mindset we want to get out of. All right, testing is everybody's responsibility. So let's talk about that. I'm sorry? So then what does the tester do? Tester yeah, we're going to talk about that, all right? So these are all the types of testing. These test, tests down here are primarily the responsibility of the developers. All right? These are the technical folks on the team. They are primarily building these tests to prove that the code works as they intended to, do, to, co to work. These tests up here um, are primarily the responsibility of the business analyst or the testers um, in collaboration with the developers. These tests up here prove that the system works as per the requirements or as expected, all right? Big difference. These tests are about do they work based on the business requirements? These tests are do they work based on how I, as a developer, intended it to work, all right? Sometimes these things, uh, we expect these things to be the same, but sometimes they're not. And that's why we have different types of tests, all right? So this is the responsibility of the developer. This is the responsibility of the analysts or the testers in collaboration with the developers. Over here, you might need the help of operations in collaboration with the developers. And we move, when we move up here, it's typically the testers working um, with our business partners. All right? So everybody has a role to play depending on the type of test that we're building. But all of these tests together are part of our testing strategy.
All right? Cool. So let's start first with the tests that the developers should be focusing on, kind of our, our uh, uh, quadrant at the bottom. And uh, the approach uh, we should be taking is referred to as test-driven development, where we start out. Remember day one, so we start out, before we write any code, we start out by writing a test, and we run that test. That test will fail because there's no code yet. All right, that's why um, it's, uh, it's uh, in red. Then we write some code and just enough code to make the test pass. And that's why it's shown in green. Once the test passes, we, try, we clean up our code, making sure the test still passes. And then uh, we think about our next problem and we move on and write our next test. And this cycle goes on um, until we're done with our work. So as a typical way of approaching, we don't start with coding, we start with a test and a very, very small test to solve a very small problem. So from a development perspective, that's how we work, that's how our approach should be, right? When we do this, testing no longer becomes a phase. Testing becomes an ongoing activity that we're doing all the time. And not only that, uh, when we're done coding, all right, when I'm down here, when I'm done coding, I'm done testing because now this test passes, all right? So this is referred to as test-driven development. Um, and I want to highlight, this is not a technique to, the goal here is not to have high code coverage. All right, this is going to be a conversation for another talk, but the goal is not to have high code coverage. The goal is uh, to design um, a, an application that is testable, that is maintainable, that is loosely coupled, that is easily changeable. All right, this is the goal of test-driven development. It's a design approach. It has a side benefit Right? A side benefit of that is that you will have high code coverage, but that is not the goal. Right? That is just a side benefit. Right? So, um, by doing that, we establish a huge chunk of our code, a big chunk of our pyramid, as being unit tests. Right? Because that's, that's part of how we're just coding. Right? Let's move on. Let's move on and talk about how do we approach our functional tests and uh, our acceptance tests? All right. Again, I mentioned those should be automated. Uh, there was some discussion whether that should be automated or not. But here's the one thing I tell you is please, please don't do the functional testing from the UI. This is pretty much the predominant testing approach um, out there. Everybody tests their application via the UI. They finish coding, then they go to the application and test it out via the browser or whatever interface you're working with and see the results, all right? Why do I say that, all right? Let's walk through a, a simplified example here. Let's say I have an application um, and it's a shopping cart and what I want to test is what I, when I add stuff to the shopping cart, I have a running total. So I always see the total of the items that I've added to my shopping cart, all right? Simple scenario, shopping cart, I'm going to add stuff to it and what I want to test is that the total displays the sum of whatever I have in my shopping cart. All right. Here's uh, my simplified application again. Now think about the steps I need to do to test that the totals in my shopping cart are correct. All right. If I'm testing via the UI, I have to log in, search for an item, add it to my cart, and then, and then search for another item and add it to my cart. And only then can I check the total, right? I went through all these steps um, to just check the total. Then I'll search for another item, add it, and check the total. Remove an item and check the total, right? I'm going through a bunch of extra steps that are not needed to test the functionality of checking totals. And again, this is a simplified example here. Um, in, in your applications, you probably go through 10, 15, 20 steps to get to the piece of code that you really want to test when you're doing functional testing from the UI. And if you have many scenarios like that, each one of those is going to take a long time, right? So what's happening behind the scenes is you have code all over the application, and this is the code, right? This is the code that does the addition. This is the code that I really want to test. But I, when I'm doing a search, I'm going through this code that I don't care about. 
When I'm logging in, I'm going through this code that I don't care about. When I'm adding an item to my shopping cart, I'm going through this code that I don't care about. All right? I'm, I'm going through a lot of pieces of the application that I don't care about. This is the code that I care about. All right? So do functional testing, but attach it to where the code belongs. All right? Attach it to where the code belongs. All right? well, from an automation perspective, a lot of you might use Selenium. Has anybody heard of Selenium before? All right, Selenium is a great tool, but not to do functional testing because it is typically doing this all the time. All right, and it's going to be very painful to maintain if you're running a zillion scenarios using a Selenium. All right, we need it, but for other reasons, not necessarily functional testing. All right. So yes. Is your is your philosophy behind this guidance to make functional tests more maintainable? Yes, absolutely. You want, you want functional tests to be attached to, to the code as, that the logic is in, as close as possible to the code where the logic is in. If you're running, a, uh, you're running four or five scenarios through here, just to get to, get to this code over here, um, that's a waste and that's uh, hard to maintain. Yeah, right? to maintain. Yep. All right, so if, if the logic is sitting here, that's where you want to attach your test to. And I'll talk a bit uh, about how you do that from a uh, functional or acceptance testing perspective. That's all right. what I, was, I, I, I was thinking you need all those elements because of uh, not integration, but uh, dependencies or anything like that. Or, you know, or is that, shouldn't that become an issue? So, so you need to run a test to check that login works. You need to run a test to check that I can add an item to the cart. But if I'm running a test to check that the sum works, right? I'm, adding a, I'm running a test to make sure that the totals are always correct. I don't need to run all these other tests for this, right? Or go through those steps. I already have tests that test those pieces. I just want to test that the sum works, right? And, and that's what we need to separate out, right? So um, to do that, uh, some of you mentioned this um, earlier when we first started. We want to use a technique referred to as executable specification, all right? And this technique um, is a non-technical non technique, so it doesn't require um, programming knowledge for our uh, testers or business analysts. Uh, they can write tests that we can run, um, and it's uh, via examples. And uh, let's walk through one, all right? Over here, we have a user story, all right? Uh, we have a user story that, that uh, we have a shopping cart, and we're going to um, collect books in, in the shopping carts. And here are some acceptance criteria along with this user story, all right? I can um, add books. Uh, I can remove some books. Uh, the shopping basket is initially empty. And the same books, book can be added multiple times, all right? Typical user story with some acceptance criteria along with it, all right? Let's take one of those uh, acceptance criteria and walk through it. And what I want to highlight is the user story is basically our requirements and our tests. They work together, all right? The user story and our requirements give us uh, our tests that we're gonna run, all right? Here's our first acceptance criteria. When we're working through, through this with our client, with our business partners, we wanna ask them, give us an example. What does that look like? Um, and they're gonna say, well, given I don't have anything in my basket, when I add a book, I expect to see this book in my basket. Again, simplified example, but that is, that is one acceptance criteria that I can add a book to the shopping cart, all right? Given that I don't have a shopping cart, if I add a book to the shopping cart, I expect to see that book to the shopping cart. And then you can also add that you expect to see the total, um, and the totals are add adding up correctly, and so forth, all right? Now, this right here is an automated acceptance test. I can plug this in and run it, and it'll return pass or fail. It's written in English, all right? A non-technical person can write this, all right? This is referred to as Gherkin, all right? The syntax is referred to as Gherkin. Um, there are some rules, but I have, to write, I have to write things in a given, when, then type of syntax. And I can plug it into my application and run it, and it'll return pass or fail, all right? It's a functional test. It's a user acceptance test. Um, it describes a business requirement. We can plug it in, run it, 
and it's the return results. Now, I have to collaborate with my developer because the developers on the team uh, need to attach this test to the code, all right? But once it's attached, I can run many, many different scenarios and verify that it works. Here's uh, the same user story with, the other, with another uh, acceptance criteria, that I can add multiple books uh, to my shopping cart or shopping basket. Um, given that I have a shopping basket with a book already in it, if I add another book, then I should have two copies of the same book a business requirement, a functional requirement, this is a test that I can plug in and it will return pass or fail. All right? This technique is referred to as specification by example. The syntax that we are talking about takes on the given when then type of syntax um, is referred to as Gherkin. And we can, uh, again, th this, this English written file is an executable test that we can run, and it becomes part of our automated test suite. All right, one of the tools that combine our overall testing strategy. All right, uh, we refer to this as uh, green documents or executable specifications, because instead of writing spreadsheets, all right, if some of you are familiar with our traditional testing, you pretty much have a long spreadsheet uh, where you have uh, the uh, scenario you are testing, um, steps you need to take, expected result, actual result, and then pass-fail column, and somebody goes through all of these and then marks them pass-fail, pass-fail, pass-fail. Instead of doing that, use this technique, all right, because these become actual tests that you can run over and over and over again, becomes part of your regression test suite. But not only that, the minute the code changes, the test will fail, or the minute the requirements changes, the test will fail, all right? So they become green documents because they don't go stale. We're always running them over and over again, so our documentation and our code will always be in sync, all right? They're always gonna be in sync. We're not gonna have one without, without the other, all right? This helps us uh, keep our documentation and our code always in sync. All right, does that make sense? All right. So, is, so you mentioned Gherkin, is Cucumber the main? Cucumber is the tool that you will run this through. Um, there are others, but Cucumber is one of the tools that you can run Gherkin through to return to you the pass or fail results. Is that the main right. tool everybody uses? Uh, depending on uh, your, your tech stack. All right. All right. Yes. Thank you. Yes, Okay. Cool. Now again, this will require collaboration. Uh, we mentioned uh, one of the pain points earlier that there's no collaboration. This is one way. Uh, this will require collaboration between the developers and the testers. Developers write their tests using Gherkin. The developers will then need to take this test and pretty much hook it up. And that's why I was, what I was referring to earlier. We wanna hook it up as close to our code as possible. And in this case, they'd wanna hook it up over here to test if things are being added properly, as opposed to when we're using Selenium, we hook it up over here. And we're, we wanna test something all the way down here, all right? So there's various techniques where you can hook up that script as close to the code um, as possible. All right, so let's keep going. All right, as, as our approach of how do we start testing on day one, um, our developers and testers are working together and by using this technique, you can then uh, do something referred to as acceptance test driven development. All right, we talked about uh, test driven development where, where the developers are doing the um, writing a test first, then writing some code, then refactoring, then writing another test, writing some code and then refactoring. Here, um, our business analysts, our testers can start doing that from day one. All right, you get a user story. Along with that user story, there's some acceptance criteria. And I start out by writing out uh, my specifications, my executable specifications, just like the example we just saw. And we run that test, all right? Given when then, whatever this, the acceptance criteria is, we create given when then scenarios and we run it. That test will fail, all right? It's failing on day one. 
All right. On day one, <laughs> as a tester or business analyst, I create a test and we hook it up to our uh, um, uh, continuous integration server. It runs and it fails because we haven't written any code yet. Um, the developers that are going to work on the story, they go through their test driven development cycle where they're writing uh, their tests at the unit level or at the integration level or at the system level. And they keep doing that until this one automated acceptance test passes. This one Gherkin syntax test passes. And then we move on to our next acceptance criteria. All right. So the way it's going to work is for each acceptance criteria, you will have many automated acceptance tests. And for each automated acceptance test, you will have many, many um, unit tests. And this is how you're going to kind of build out your pyramid where you're going to have many unit tests, less integration tests, less acceptance tests, and so forth. But we're starting on day one. And when we are done coding, all right, when we are done coding, we are done testing. All right? Why? Because we wrote these tests um, as executable specification on day one. And we can spend most of the other days in the sprint doing the manual testing that we need to do, which is about exploratory testing and usability testing. Right. Does that make sense? Cool. A couple of questions and we'll move on. Yeah. Quick question. Uh, so do these tests happen uh, during check-in? So when the DevOps checks in the code, that's when you do the, at least the automated experience. Yep. Uh, so every time you check in the code, your CI server will pick that up okay. and will run a suite of tests. It will first, it'll first run the unit tests um, and then the integration tests and then the acceptance tests and so forth. If it fails, it kicks back, otherwise it, it integrates the code. Correct. Right. So if it fails, you're going to get an error. So as a developer, I'm going to know because I just checked it. I'm going to get immediate feedback right. and it's going to tell me this test failed. So I'm going to go and figure out what, what did I just do? What did I just mess up? Let me fix it and try again. Mm -hmm. All right. Cool. So um, we've uh, we've covered uh, these two here. Um, we'll look at uh, usability and exploratory testing in a second. This stuff I'm, I'm not going to cover um, in this talk, but first how many of you are working with existing applications, which we refer to as legacy, all right? Many of you are. Not, not all of us are lucky enough to be working with Greenfield, which is brand new applications, where we can take all of this stuff that I'm talking about and start applying it fresh, all right? So if you are working with Greenfield applications, you have to change your strategy uh, slightly, all right? This was our old application, all right? You can't basically take two weeks off, a month off, and say, oh my God, we don't have any unit tests, and our testing strategy says we need to have tons of unit tests, so we're gonna spend tons of time writing unit tests. Please don't do that. That will not get you any benefits at all. All right, when we're, again, we're supposed to be writing the unit tests along with the code when we're writing the code, not you know six months later, a year later, or five years later. All right, so if you're already working with an existing application and it has minimal Test, uh, automated testing, you have uh, not very high test code coverage, all of your testing is manual, all right? Um, you need a different strategy, all right? Taking time off and starting to write unit tests, integration tests, not gonna be very helpful, right? So your test strategy uh, instead should be um, safety, all right? We wanna write system tests, acceptance tests that cover as much of the application as possible, all right? Which is contrary to what I was telling you earlier. But you need to start first by establishing a safety net. So pick the most common scenarios that you currently have, uh, the most uh, risky scenarios that you want to make sure are always working, and write long running tests to get a lot of coverage over your code base. All right? Not tons and tons of applications. Uh, do it smartly. Pick those scenarios and write out those tests so you have that safety net out there. Yes. Yes, legacy applications. For, for Greenfield, you want to do what I talked about before. Uh, start out with your unit tests, move on to your integration tests, system tests, acceptance tests. When you have an existing application, you are going to assume that all of your code currently works, doesn't have any bugs in it, and you are going to write long running tests to establish an initial safety net. All right? Now, once you have that, you're going to slowly you know, change out your strategy. Anytime there's a bug, all right? so over here we have a bug, the first thing I do is I write a unit test and I prove that yes, the bug exists. Then I fix the code. 
um, and I rerun my test and I, I see it pass and I'm like, okay, now I'm slowly adding unit tests as we're moving on, all right? And I will slowly add integration tests and so forth. So anytime there's a bug, I write a unit test first, I prove that the bug exists, then I fix it, and then I keep that test, it's just gonna stay. And I slowly start, you know, moving from having long running uh, system tests or acceptance tests to uh, more and more and more unit tests. Did you have a question? Yeah. Yeah, the way I'm hearing you describing it, it sounds like these little testlets are basically throwaways. They're almost one-offs. Which ones? The, the unit tests. No, absolutely not. The, they, they, uh, I'm sorry if, I, if you missed that. The, the, all these tests that we're doing become part of our regression test suite that we are going to run okay. over and over and over again. Okay. And they're going to be at different levels. They're going to be at different levels. We're going to have some tests that are testing very specific uh, units of functionality, some tests that are testing two things talking to each other, some tests are testing multiple things talking to each other, exactly. and so forth. Exactly. And we do them once, but we run them over and over and over again, and that builds up our overall automated regression test suite. Got it. Okay? Thank you. And so that's how we're, we're, that's how we're balancing out here. Um, we're gonna start balancing out our uh, kind of triangle. We're gonna get, uh, you know, write these long tests first to establish safety, then we're gonna walk through on these, uh, every time we have a bug, we write a test first. Every time we add new code, we write a test first, then we add the code, um, then we rerun the test and make sure it passes, and we then do the same for the integration system and acceptance tests, right? So you start out with what you have, figure out the scenarios, then add the tests, um, and then if you have a bug, you start out by writing unit tests. If you're adding a new code, you start out by writing unit tests. But for the existing, existing code that you have, um, don't bother writing unit tests for it um, on the onset. Slowly add those in. All right? Okay, cool. Let's uh, wrap it up with our uh, usability testing. All right, again, we said this is where we want to do manual testing. This is where we need a human uh, to tell us that, you know, this might not really uh, make a lot of sense. All right? it might be a bit awkward to use. I'm not gonna be able to write an automated test for this. I'm gonna to have to use it and then realize that, um, hey, these, these are kind of placed in the wrong place. It's not gonna be very helpful. Somebody's gonna say, hey, you know, this uh, might not really work, all right? It is um, awkward, all right? Again, we need a human to tell us that. Or, or this workaround um, isn't really uh, gonna do that well, all right? It's working, but you know, we're not gonna go a lot with this or this user interface um, is gonna give me a headache, right? <laughs> so this is what we need manual testing for, all right? We need manual testing for somebody to read a message and then tell us, uh, you know, that what we did here uh, isn't the most helpful. Uh, it's, we need to change it up, all right? That's, that's what we're doing with usability testing. That's where we need to spend our manual testing on. The other aspect of it is referred to as exploratory testing. And many people think, oh, exploratory testing is you know, ad hoc testing. Um, and it is not, all right? Exploratory testing is not ad hoc testing and it is not um, comprehensive testing, all right? It's neither ad hoc nor comprehensive testing, all right? Um, it is a disciplined approach to testing. Um, it is non-scripted, but it is disciplined um, and it combines both our uh, learning, our design, and our execution all together in one while applying certain test heuristics to figure out not the normal stuff that we've already tested, all right? This is not about verifying our requirements. This is about uncovering other bugs that you would not uncover otherwise, all right? This is what exploratory testing is, and it's very, very powerful. It's a very, very powerful technique to uncover true bugs that are you know, outside of the, does it meet the requirements or not, all right? And typically the way it works is uh, via sessions. The sessions are time boxed and they have, we have a certain charter or certain mission, all right? Today I'm gonna be a type of user and I have a goal, I need to accomplish a specific task. Um, as a tester, I'm gonna give myself um, a time box, we'll figure out you know, what the time box is, and the goal is to go in as a user and try to accomplish that mission, 
but you are encouraged to deviate from that mission based on what's happening with your interaction with the application. All right? As you are trying to accomplish some goal, based on results you are getting back, based on things you are seeing as you're interacting with the application, you are encouraged to deviate and explore what's going on. And then once the time box is over, you get together back as a group and you report your findings. And based on that, um, you decide what new charters you need to do, what new missions do you need to do, what new areas of the application you want to test. All right? Again, it, uh, there's various heuristics as to you know, uh, what to test, how to test, um, when to deviate from the mission, uh, and so forth. But it is not random ad hoc testing. It is a disciplined approach to uncover tests, um, not from the traditional um, business requirements perspective. All right? And I think that wraps up um, our uh, three quadrants. Like I said, I'm not going to cover uh, the fourth quadrant, uh, and I'll, I'll summarize and I'll pause for some questions, all right, because we did cover a lot. So first of all, um, testing uh, is not a phase. Testing is an ongoing activity that we do it all, all the time. Uh, there's a lot of tests that we need to do, and it is everybody's responsibility. Everybody has a role to play. Everybody is leading in one area of our testing. Testing should start on day one. Um, all scripted tests should be automated. All tests where I can say, um, do this, then do this, and expect this result, those are types that we can automate. All right? uh, most of the automation at the unit level, integration, system level, that is primarily uh, a developer's responsibility. If we are doing functional testing, please use executable specification. It's a very powerful tool. Don't do uh, automation uh, functional testing from the UI. Attach your code or your test as close to the code as possible. And most of our manual testing we want to save for things like usability testing and exploratory testing. All right. And I think that's it. All right. So any questions? Yes. Yep. or even anticipation of the code, um, must be a certain kind of scripting uh, insofar as you're not quite sure how the code contours are going to be. Correct. The, the, so like I said, how do you anticipate that? It is, it, is a design, it, is, it is a design strategy. So you are, uh, before you code, you are basically thinking, uh, this, this uh, code that I'm about to write um, what inputs uh, do I think it's going to have? What uh, outputs am I going to expect? How do I expect it to behave? Okay. And, I, and I write a test based on that. All right? So I'm going to write a test based on um, what I'm uh, expecting the code, how the code I'm ex how the code's going to behave. I then write the code. And while I'm writing it, I might realize that, oh, you know what? This is not really going to work. And then I go back and I change the test and I write the code again. And this is why the cycle uh, is set up this way. It is a, a design approach that's going to help us uh, keep our code you know, properly isolated, loosely coupled, um, not have um, many, a large piece of our application with many things intertwined. Um, by doing that, it keeps things uh, separate and uh, well organized so that it is testable, it is maintainable, um, and so forth. All right. Yeah. Yes. What do you do if your legacy code is in a software program like Informatica, where it's hard to run parts of it? Uh, that would be even uh, uh, more challenging. You will be running uh, much longer uh, pieces of code, like I mentioned. Uh, you will have long-running tests. Uh, in those in those situations where you cannot dig deeper and break it up. Uh, you, you again want to think about the most common scenarios that you have and focus on, focus on those to have your code coverage uh, and build your safety net so that you, you know that when you change something, those things are still working. All right? Yeah. Because the, the way you set it up, that you have to do just about all the tests you've written every single time. Now, we know that in most organizations will have enough uh, server power to do a continuous integration and continuous 
button. In that case, would you suggest to be selective as to... Most organizations don't have, sorry, what? The uh, server power for... Server power? Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, very good. Yeah, this, this doesn't require, uh, I mean, depending on the application you're running, but it, it does not require server power. And remember, it is, um, it decreases in amounts and in sizes. So you have a lot of unit tests that don't require a lot of power, uh, server power, and run, run very quickly, and less and less and less tests as you go up, up the chain. Oh, yeah, right? that's the part you should don't mind. Um, yes, you're, you're right when you're doing development, but when you're putting it in the regression, at any time I'm changing a section of code, you're running all the tests in that you know, Oh yeah, absolutely. So there's um, there's different approaches to that. You don't run all all of these tests on every single check-in. All right, you're going to run the uh, uh, the faster tests on every single check-in, and then you will run other tests maybe uh, you know uh, twice a day, and then you're going to run, run other tests that take much longer to run on a nightly basis, and then you're going to run other tests maybe on a weekly basis. Right. So based on your test execution time mm -hmm. and based on the resources that they require, you will stagger mm -hmm. um, the different types of tests uh, to run. But the, uh, the one thing I would look at is if a test is taking a very long time to run, I would uh, you know, debug why and whether there's a good well, reason why that is and if there's a, a better way to structure the test so that it runs faster. Yeah. But typically you can you know, isolate your tests so that they're running on different schedules. Yeah, I yeah. advise people to run the tests which will make, uh, if you were to fail, will make the entire application uh, uh, non-usable. Those are the tests you need to run. If there's a workaround of some errors, you can yeah. run it. Uh, now, there are other types of tests that we didn't talk about. You can have sanity, sanity type check tests mm -hmm. that you yeah. want to run throughout the application to make sure it's up and running. Um, and you can have smoke tests as well. So there are other tests we didn't really cover here, um, but you can do that as well. All right? Do you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll try to repeat the question if you can. So uh, sure. Fair and by the way, do you have questions? Um, you got All right. I'll come back. I'll come to you next. Okay. Uh, I don't know if this is a testing per se question, but it's like, what do you do? How do you approach a team which is not buying the day one testing? Then the developer said, I, I know it's going to test because I'm not a, I'm not a tester. Yeah, um, so, so I, I get that a lot and I, I, I run the certified Scrum developer class and most people in that class, that class is for developers. Yeah. Um, and when, they, when they're in there, it takes them a while before you know, the aha moment clicks. You know, we go through several exercises where we're doing hands-on coding and then the aha moment kicks, kicks in because it is there, what they are doing and doing this approach, I'm gonna say this again, it is not about testing it is about design practices. And then they will realize that you know, doing this helps them better uh, design an application, which in turn has a side effect of having uh, better test coverage. All right? Now the other example I'm gonna give you is you know, the uh, typical uh, Amazon and Google example, uh, which is as developers, they give you pagers. And if there's a problem, you get paged, all right, to come and fix it. Um, and that helps people not only care about building better code and better testing, but also care about how is this going to uh, work in, uh, in production and how am I going to figure out what the problem is when it's out in production. All right? If somebody's not feeling the pain, they're not going to care. All right? So in companies like Amazon and Google, you, know, you are responsible. All right? I'm not going to hand it off and it's somebody else's problem. All right? If there's a problem, um, and I was working on this, I'm going to be the one that has to come in and fix it. So now I'm feeling the pain and now I need to uh, you know, take, do, a better, do a better job to make sure that if there is a problem, I can quickly figure out what it is. And even better, let me make sure there's no problem to begin with. Yeah. All right? Yeah. right? You want to uh, think yeah. of those strategies. Yeah. Thank you. Should we go uh, to the live stream? Does Amazon still use pagers? <laughs> Amazon still use pagers? Oh, that's a good question. No, is, no, is, that is that sterling? Is that sterling? It's not. Don't worry about that question. Uh, any advice on, this is from Craig Eddy, any advice on helping break down those silos between, quote, the test team, unquote, and the, quote, development team, especially if they're on different contracts? Ooh. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah. Uh, uh, so but that's uh, going to get us into contracting questions, all right? Yeah. Uh, the... Okay. 
you're going to have to look back as to, yes, we are on separate contracts, but we're all working uh, for the same client and building the same product. So the end result here um, is to deliver a quality product uh, to the client. Um, beyond that, um, it's going to be it's going to be hard. It's going to be context contextual to uh, the people that are working and the relationship between vendor A and vendor B and the client. All right, it's going to be on the client to uh, push for better collaboration across both both vendors. I don't know if anybody from the audience has any experience. Yes, yeah. so, uh, I do. It wasn't my group, but another group I worked with closely, and uh, the development manager went to the customer convince the customer to push it down. Yeah. So yeah, when, when, you, when you're in that situation, uh, the suggestion was that the, the, you know, the customer or the client needs to be the one driving this to um, enhance the collaboration. All right. Any other questions uh, from the stream? Where does Kaizen Co. come from? Uh, Kaizen Co. Where did you get Yeah, the, the name. So uh, Kaizen is uh, continuous improvement. Um, and the co part is uh, the small ongoing continuous improvements. Alright. So that's that's great. Alright. Speaking of testing quarter, can you give me an example of uh, critique product? Critique the product? Um, so critiquing the product is basically um, telling us how the product is doing. So when you when you do usability testing or user exploratory testing, it's telling us how is the product doing. Um, the other tests um, um, are primarily to support the team so that when they make changes, they know that it's still working or support the team to know that they're meeting the business requirements. But the things like performance testing, stress testing, um, it's basically telling us how is the product behaving um, and how is the product being responsive and things, things along those natures. That's what I mean by critiquing the product. It's tests that are telling us you know, how is the product behaving as a whole. All right. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Fadi. We've got the uh, raffle giveaway. I also want to explain something, but I definitely want to thank Mark Kuppler in the back back there for making the live stream cool. uh, happen. Thank, thank you, Brian, you. for organizing all of this. No worries. Yeah. Oh, no, uh, uh, yeah. Not too late. You must be present to win. Uh, one more over there. The, uh, and also be sure to thank Victoria on the way out for uh, her meeting and the hostess. Uh, and also, last thing, if you get a chance, we love feedback. Uh, continuous and small improvements uh, make uh, DC SUG a better place to come to. Uh, so whether you have feedback for Fadi in this presentation, green, great presentation, yellow, mixed, red, not so great, leave feedback on actual words on the card will help as well as, as to what that might be. That's for Fadi. For us as the uh, you know, DC SUG organizers, we also like feedback. So green, if you thought the event was great, keep doing what you're doing, love the food. Even leave a note, same thing. Yellow is like, yeah, you could probably improve in this area. Leave a note about it. Red is like, if you don't improve this, we're probably not coming back. <laughs> so we want to we know that. All right. We want to know all of it. So. Uh, but also, I, uh, uh, the, the slides, like I said, they're on the website um, along with a full blog series that kind of recaps uh, what we just talked about. And uh, Kaiser Co. has uh, graciously all right. the book, and Fadi is going to pick out the lucky winner. All right, and the lucky Sorry, winner. Sorry, online, you got to be present to win. Physically. What do we have here? 806? 806. Oh, okay. Is that you, Danielle? Oh. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thanks, All right, please come back. Again, we have another one on the 29th, because I forgot to add, or whatever that last Monday is of July. It's uh, seven depths of Agile L or something. <laughs> um, <laughs> two damage. It's one of the talks that they're giving at Agile 2019. So. Should be a great talk. We'll have more great food. Be sure to take some food we'll on the way here. out. What's we'll that? Be here, yeah. Same place, yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're 90% uh, of the time here. So yeah, for the new folks, this happens uh, typically once a month. Sometimes we have uh, people in town, so we run more than one. So uh, just keep that, keep that in mind. What did you say the next one was? It's the last Monday in July. Oh, and what did you say the talk was? The seven sons of agile oh. hell or something. Oh. <laughs> 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 you are oh. sounds fun. It's basically about challenges in uh, implementing agile, I think, in the federal government. Oh, okay. Oh, that's oh, 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 yeah. oh, yeah. oh, yeah. yeah. Or large corporations. Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. yeah, my experience we, we, says that as well. Yeah. Are you going to present? Thank you online for those folks who joined on the watch stream. Are you going to present? Have a good night. No, that one is two different speakers. Oh, okay.
Um, yep. Do you ever go to DC uh, web uh, yep. API?